perhaps no flower has mesmerized humans quite like the poppy. Since prehistoric times, they've been grown for food, for beauty, for medicine, and self-medication. Opium poppies produce addictive and powerful narcotics. In some countries, it's illegal to cultivate them. In addition to the notorious opium or bread seed poppy, there are about 70 other species in hundreds of varieties, from the frilly Papaver orientale to the feathery annual Papaver somniferum lacinatum. Poppies are symbols of remembrance. Through antiquity, they were regarded as sacred, mysterious, magical, and as indications of health, wealth, and fertility. They've even made their way into popular culture. With poison in it, but attractive to the eye and soothing to the smell. <laughs> Poppies. Poppies will put them to sleep. Sleep. When author Frank Baum wrote The Wizard of Oz at the turn of the 20th century, opium was an everyday drug, as it had been for hundreds of years. In 1753, the Swedish botanist Carl Linnaeus used the Latin word meaning sleep bringing to categorize the opium poppy as Papaver somniferum. The scientific name reminds us of the poppy's dark power. Like tea, sugar, petroleum, and gold, opium fueled global trade and touched off wars. It was a foundation for traditional medicine and is used in modern pharmaceuticals, but it can also ensnare its users in deadly addiction. Only a handful of countries are permitted to grow opium poppies for medicine. Half of the legal global supply comes from Tasmania, Australia but an illicit trade endangers people all over the world. There are hundreds of varieties of Papaver somniferum. The seeds are legal to buy and sell in the US. We wouldn't sell them if they weren't. And though opium is technically a Schedule II drug, cultivating poppies as ornamentals or for seed shouldn't get the DEA knocking at your door. Most papaver varieties contain at least a trace of narcotic elements, though breeders in India have created a variety called suata that doesn't produce any latex and is free of the alkaloid from which opium is produced. A wild ancestor of poppies, a dwarf species called Papaver cetagerum, has grown in the Mediterranean for thousands of years. Opium poppies' closest relative is thought to have hailed from a region along the Black Sea in Turkey. It's often been said that the Sumerians first cultivated poppies in the Middle East around 3000 BC, calling it joy plants. But could it have been the Neolithic farmers of Europe who did it first, some 2,000 years before that? In my heart, I think that they all had a version of the poppy, a very crude poppy. There were things that were then developing from these poppies that they were farming into painkillers. And I think that because Turkey was such a great source of trade, that these things just passed between there for so long that out of that came the beginning of the opium poppy. No one really knows exactly when it was discovered that poppies also contained opium. It's an alkaloid in the bitter, milky latex that can be coaxed from an immature flower pod with the slip of a sharp blade. But we do know that people have been using it for thousands of years for medicine, ritual, escape, and pleasure. The earliest evidence of opium as a narcotic was discovered at a more than 5,000-year-old Neolithic burial site near Barcelona, where researchers found a poppy seed lodged in the tooth of an elderly man's skeletal remains. By the early days of the Bronze Age, carried through burgeoning trade routes, poppies and poppy seeds took hold in the eastern Mediterranean and from there spread around the world. 
The Minoans, an ancient civilization that thrived in the Aegean islands off the coast of Greece, were among the earliest to trade in opium poppies. Archaeological explorations along their trade routes found jugs called lekithi depicting scarified poppy pods. It appears that the Minoans had figured out how to harvest opium from poppies. From the very first trading cycles that go around the ancient classical world, we have poppy seeds passing around. All poppy heads contain a little bit of just opium, and it's not very powerful. But if you grow one in the perfect conditions of the right species, that's very powerful. So people would carry poppy seeds from one place to the other because they were a currency. Opium poppies got to Egypt sometime between 1600 and 1500 BC, around the same time as they arrived in Crete and Cyprus. Egyptians began cultivating poppies, known as opium thebiacum, in fields around the capital of Thebes, a city along the Nile. The opium trade flourished, and its medicinal value was embraced. The Ebers papyrus, an exhaustive plant medicinal encyclopedia dating to 1534 BC, documents poppies' use for insomnia and as an anesthetic and pain reliever. The 110-page scroll, taken from a tomb in the 19th century and sold to German Egyptologist Georg Moritz Ebers, also offered advice on how to stop a crying child. Mix poppy pods with fly dirt, which is on the wall. It acts at once. The ancient Greeks saw opium poppies as sacred and believed that Demeter, the goddess of harvest, earth, and renewal first discovered them. Demeter and her daughter Persephone were often depicted carrying grain in one hand and poppies in the other. Hippocrates, the Greek physician considered to be the father of Western medicine, recognized opium's usefulness as a narcotic and a medicine. It took hold in the Arab world as well. For example, the renowned Muslim physician Al-Razi may have been the first to use it as a general anesthetic. Some scholars believe that Alexander the Great introduced the opium poppy to India around 300 BC. It's also possible that Arabs introduced it in the 7th century AD as they conquered territory ranging from Spain to northern India. Ayurvedic medical texts don't mention opium at all until around the 8th century. There's no record of opium as part of ancient Chinese medical tradition before the 7th century. It didn't arrive there until Arab traders brought it sometime during the Tang Dynasty, between 618 and 907, spread through the Silk Road trade routes that connected Asia, Europe, and parts of Africa. During the Song Dynasty, however, helped along by its consumption in Buddhist monasteries, opium was used as a remedy for ailments like coughing and diarrhea, as well as for pain relief. In traditional Chinese medicine, poppy capsules have sour, astringent, neutral, and toxic properties, and they are associated with the lungs, large intestines, and kidneys. Tobacco and smoking came to China in the 1600s, and the practice of mixing opium and tobacco caught on too. By 1729, alarmed by the rise in opium smoking, Qing dynasty leaders in Beijing outlawed it. Some 70 years later, they banned growing or importing opium as well. Nevertheless, by the 1800s, there were an estimated 10 million opium smokers in China, 2 million of them addicts. Despite the prohibition, the British East India Company was supplying the Chinese market with opium from the huge poppy fields it controlled in Bengal, India to offset its trade imbalance with China. An opium poppy variety grew in China, but it didn't pack much of a punch, Inglis says. So when the opium from India started to come in, they embraced it as a people and the Cantonese merchants were willing to defy Beijing because it made them so much money. 
On the eve of the first opium war in 1839, the British were shipping more than 5 million pounds of opium to China each year, helped along by Chinese smugglers who ran the drug to small ports using boats called fast crabs and scrambling dragons. American merchants were shipping opium to China too, though in smaller quantities. To quell the opium epidemic, some in the Chinese government wanted to target users, but it was Lin Zexu who prevailed in convincing the Qing dynasty leaders that they should strike at the source instead. In 1839, he went to Canton, now Guangzhou, to take on the British opium traders. In a strongly worded open letter to Queen Victoria, he castigated the British monarch for allowing the opium trade to continue despite the knowledge that it was ruining lives. And he succeeded in forcing British traders to turn over nearly three million pounds of opium from their ships, which was then mixed with lime and dumped into the water. Britain saw this as an affront to its sovereignty and retaliated. Ultimately, the Chinese were no match for Britain's military might. The First Opium War ended in 1842 with the Treaty of Nanking, which gave the British control of Hong Kong. But trade tensions between the West and Qing rulers never resolved, and in 1856, Britain invaded China again, this time joined by France. These military confrontations with Western powers ultimately spelled the beginning of the end for the dynastic system in China. Poppies had spread to Japan during the Nanban trade era between 1543 and 1615. Portuguese traders had brought poppy seeds from India to the Tsuguru region, today's Aomori prefecture. As an homage to their introduction, poppies were called Tsuguru, and they were grown for medicinal purposes on small plots of land in the region, today's Yamanashi prefecture and in the Wakayama and Osaka areas. The poppy plant's name was later changed to Keshi, the old name for mustard and mustard seeds. By the time Swiss-German alchemist Paracelsus developed a concoction he called laudanum in the 16th century, packages of opium gum were making their way around the world, along with tea, spices, and other goods. Paracelsus had figured out how to macerate the hard, bitter-tasting gum and make it into something more palatable. His recipe for pills called Stones of Immortality used thebaic opium, spices, citrus juice, and quintessence of gold. They were prescribed as painkillers. About 150 years later, in 1680, British apothecary Thomas Sydenham introduced his recipe for laudanum, made with opium, sherry, wine, and herbs. It became immensely popular and abused. Most any druggist would make and dispense the concoction, and people could even bring their own pint bottles for a refill. In 1804, German pharmacist Friedrich Zerturner had isolated opium's most active alkaloid. Gram for gram, morphine, as he called it, was 10 times more potent than opium itself. In 1832, French chemist Pierre Robuquet isolated codeine from opium. In the mid-19th century, opium made its way into American medicine. Laudanum elixirs, often imported from England, were a staple in the bride's boxes packed along with pioneer couples who headed west to make their new homes. These included formulas made especially for children. Morphine was the go-to drug for Civil War doctors, who used it to treat everything from traumatic injuries to diarrhea and dysentery. Though the hypodermic needle had been invented, doctors often applied morphine salts on the skin. Morphine addiction came to be known as the army disease, and concerns about it fueled a movement to regulate the drugs. The first law, passed in the 1890s, was just a tax, not a prohibition. Then, in 1914, the Harrison Act required all parties importing, exporting, or manufacturing opioids to register with the government, though doctors were exempt. In 1898, Bayer had introduced another kind of opiate, heroin, synthesized from opium. At first, it was hailed as a wonder drug, 
until it became clear that heroin was highly addictive. International legal restrictions on heroin tamped down demand and sent its distribution underground. In the 1930s and 40s, when drug use was generally on the decline, most of the U.S. heroin supply came from Turkey and Southeast Asia, trafficked through the so-called French connection by the Sicilian mafia and Corsican gangsters in Marseille. And though we often associate the Vietnam War with a surge in opioid addictions among returning soldiers, the problem goes back to the Civil War and the Filipino-American War at the turn of the 20th century. Cheap and easy access to heroin during the Vietnam War, much of it from across the Cambodian border after the Civil War there, along with a cultural shift in attitudes toward drugs, led to an epidemic of heroin abuse among service members dealing with the stress of combat. A Pentagon study in 1973 estimated that up to 20% of soldiers had a heroin habit, though most stopped taking it once they got home. Against the backdrop of the war, President Richard Nixon declared a war on drugs and in 1970 signed the Controlled Substances Act that consolidated the nation's drug law. America's public enemy number one in the United States is drug abuse. In order to fight and defeat this enemy, it is necessary to wage a new all-out offensive. The DEA considers heroin as a Schedule I drug, highly addictive with no medicinal value, but it continues to flow through illegal channels. Today, the heroin supply comes largely from the Golden Triangle of South Asia, Thailand, Laos, and Myanmar, and the Golden Crescent of Iran, Pakistan, and Afghanistan, as well as Mexico and Colombia. Most heroin in the U.S. comes from Mexico and South America, according to the U.S. military. In Southeast Asia, illicit poppy fields grow in the interior highlands on remote mountain slopes 3,000 feet or more above sea level. Growing opium poppies has traditionally been the work of indigenous highland farmers, not the dominant ethnic groups of the lowlands. Though it's less so the case today, these farmers grew abundant yields of poppies without fertilizers, insecticides, or irrigation on small plots of land just an acre or so. Heroin production tends to flourish in the most remote, impoverished, and war-torn of places where government infrastructure and economies are weak. Nowhere is this more true than in Afghanistan, by far the world's largest producer of heroin. By some estimates, opium accounts for a third of Afghanistan's gross domestic product, with a value of nearly 7 billion U.S. dollars a year. Under the Taliban, opium production fell essentially to zero in Afghanistan after its leader, Mullah Mohammed Omar, instituted a ban in the year 2000, declaring it un-Islamic. But poppy farming resumed in the chaotic days following the U.S. invasion of Afghanistan in the fall of 2001. The Taliban imposed a tax on opium farmers and traffickers, an income stream that the U.S. badly wanted to curtail. Opium poppies and the heroin trade have been deeply entangled with U.S. policy in Afghanistan for decades. Critics say the U.S. military and the CIA turned a blind eye to the heroin trade as the U.S. backed Mujahideen rebels when the Soviet Union invaded Afghanistan in 1979. Poppies are much more than a source of potent drugs and geopolitical tensions, of course. The seeds can be milled into flour or added whole into baked goods and sweets. They're common in Central and Eastern Europe and range in color from the nutty, oil-rich white seeds to the intensely flavored blue-black ones so good for baking to the gray and brown seeds that are a bit more bland. They are rich in carbohydrates, calcium, and protein. Poppy oil is used in salad dressings, cooking oil, and products like margarine. It's also used in paints, varnishes, and cosmetics. 
The thin, densely pigmented poppy petals are made of just three layers of cells whose structure resembles puzzle pieces that leave air-filled gaps through which light can scatter. The effect is mesmerizing. No other flower, save perhaps for the tulip, can rival opium poppies for their ornamental beauty and stunning diversity. These annuals grow quickly from seed, creating a gorgeous display in spring gardens, and they are all very similar to start from seed. Well-drained soil is pretty important for poppies. They like some rich soil, but they don't require it. As long as it's well-drained, that's really what's going to make them happy. We can sow poppy seeds in the fall, allowing them to experience the exposure of winter. Those seeds are quite cold hardy. Or we can sow the seeds in late winter, early spring, and they will come to life when they're ready. Um, what's really going to coax them to germinate is 55 degrees Fahrenheit. That is when your poppies are going to start awakening. They need about 15 consecutive days at 55 degrees or warmer in order to be coaxed into germinating. We have many favorites. There's the graceful and gorgeous Hungarian blue bread seed, the showy florist pepper box with its fringed blooms in purple, red, and pink, the stunning black swan with its double blooms and frilly petals of deep burgundy, the elegant Flemish antique, a new poppy that brings to mind those once seen in antique herbal books, and the lilac pom-pom, whose large frilly blooms of lilac really stand out against the plant's blue-gray foliage. Poppies dazzle in arrangements, and so do the dried pods, which can be painted for effect or just left as they are. Breeding and selection programs around the world have given us hundreds of other poppy varieties in a rainbow of colors. The perennial oriental poppy, with its generous, bright blooms, can thrive in cooler climates for many years. California poppy is a hardy annual that can grow as a perennial in warm climates. Shirley-type poppies, such as the wonderful, amazing gray, bring classic sophistication into the annual's garden. And there's the supreme poppy, with its blooms nearly as big as a dinner plate. Butterflies and bees love this one too. Poppies are easy to grow. They love cool to moderate growing conditions, and they do best when the soil is moist but not soaking wet. At Baker Creek, they do beautifully in our winter greenhouses. We also frequently start them inside and then transplant them out when the weather is still cool. Of all the poppies, Papaver somniferum is our favorite because of its size and stunning diversity. We encourage you to plant them if it's legal in your country.